Hello, friends, and thank you for tuning in to another episode of the podcast. On this episode, I welcome Cody Ashford. He is a Central Valley filmmaker who just recently completed his first feature film. He's another writer-director, and so I wanted to have him on to just talk about the whole writer-director's journey. So, hope you enjoy. This episode is sponsored by FilmDirectingMerch.com. Head on over there to get your film directing merch and more. This episode is also sponsored by my Fiverr services. <laughs> so if you have a film, a uh, you know, an already completed short film or feature film, or even a screenplay that you need constructive feedback on, I offer some services on Fiverr as well. And the links to everything will be in the description of the show. All right. And without further ado, enjoy the writer director's journey. Hey, Cody, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me, Matt. Yeah, so go ahead. Yeah, introduce yourself to those listening and for everybody that don't already know who you are. <laughs> yeah, so so everyone, um, besides my mom. Hi, mom. Um, my name is Cody Ashford. I am a, uh, a writer and director. Uh, I'm in Central California area. And um, yeah, I guess I guess Matt wanted to have me. Matt, we met at a director's workshop about, about two months ago. Um, and I think we really, we, I actually found out about the workshop because of you. I think you had posted it and it was like Central Valley filmmakers. You yeah, know, I was like, come on, you guys come on out here for this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I'm glad yeah. you did. Yeah, me too. I was so glad to be there. Yeah. Shout out to Pam for, for making yeah, that for making that cool weekend. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Um, so yeah, so I kind of found you through tremendous pictures. I just follow them and kind of know of them, you know, in the valley. Mm -hmm. And then I saw them post or tag you in a post. And so I was like, let me follow, you know, a Central Valley director and just yeah, yeah. Know, connect and stuff. And so, yeah, you just followed me back, you know, thankfully. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then, yeah, you saw the post. And so that's how we connected. So how cool. Yeah. Just small world. That is so small. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, really. And are you originally from the Central Valley or? You so, yeah, I'm originally I'm originally from Fresno area. Um, I grew up here. Both my parents are are from here. And then I went down to uh, Los Angeles for for film school and undergrad for college. So I went to a school called Biola University. Um, the best landmark for that is that it was about like 15 minutes away from Disneyland. Um, as soon as they say that, everyone's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> cool. uh, yeah. I, I yeah, so went down. I did I did the film school thing, got the degree. I, I PA'd. Uh, for a little bit down south, I a writer's assistant, like like subbed in on a few shows down there. Um, and then I really liked being able to pay rent and my yeah. student loans back. And so I think that uh, my wife and I, that brought us back up from LA up towards towards Fresno. Um, and so it was still like jumping back and forth, still constantly applying while still uh, finally I started I started teaching um, as a as my full time job. And it was really weird once I started settling into like teaching and not worrying about some of those other things, uh, I, I started writing again. I started kind of working on, on some of these things that, you know, I felt like I couldn't do or wasn't mature enough to do when I was trying to do kind of the, the LA PA hustle and just so exhausted. But once I finally got into a place of like, oh, hey, I have a regular job, I, I have this life, and then I have the the writing life and still continuing to do that. Um that really started taking taking place again once I moved back to Fresno, which was super great. That was the last thing that I expected was like, oh, hey, now that I got out of it, my writing's able yeah. to kind of kind of work again. Yeah, because I mean, I commend you too for not getting discouraged, you know, because sometimes going back home, you kind of, you know, lose sight on the dream and all of that, but you kept, yeah, you pursued it. It it happens. It definitely happens. I know there's a few moments of like, um, so I, I taught middle school theater. Um, and so I think it's like, you know, I'm talking to all these kids with with big, big ambitions and big dreams. And then I'm like, oh, God, like, what am I what am I doing? Or like, what have I done? But um, trying to continue to like, you know, persevere and view things of like, you know, your identity is not not a permanent thing, nor is it like what you do, but it's more kind of this like that that journey of, of what's going. And I, I swear, like I became a better writer and eventually director because I taught because I had to teach some of these techniques to students. Um, I think that forced me to kind of like sharpen up my own skills um, versus just relying on what I did as a um, as a young a young filmmaker and young writer. Uh, I was like, oh, hey, if I'm teaching story structure or I'm trying to give, you know, a 14 year old character notes, like 
what does that actually mean? And, and what does that do? And I really feel like that was kind of like a, my master's program was my job was, yeah. was trying to like work through some of those things that way. Yeah, absolutely. That is a, a unique, you know, exercise in a way, you know, of how do you teach something so complex, you know, in its simplest form. And so totally. that is like an education for you in its, in itself also. Yeah. Dang, how cool. So um, fellow writer director <laughs> so yeah, you, started yeah. off, you started off writing how young like how did you get into um, this whole thing so I'm I'm the oldest of three uh siblings and I think um it, it really started like some of my earliest memories of writing are honestly like playing with uh with these like batshit crazy action figure adventures where mm-hmm. I would I would like you know basically do these you know interactive playthroughs with my younger siblings where I would be like oh yeah like you know and then this character does this and this character does and then they'd be like wow this is crazy and my my younger sibling would go tattle on me for like making too dark of plot twists and then that's that's when I was like like I remember the sit down with my mom of like hey like remember they're they're younger than you so maybe like like maybe the father doesn't have to betray his family (laughs) for the dark power and I'm like well we're, well, we're out of lessons that, always, yeah. that happened a week ago and so um so I would do this thing where I would literally like we you know we'd have toys from all Power Rangers Star Wars Ninja Turtles Narnia like whatever and I would take some of these figures and I would go place them somewhere and I would be like at some point the characters that we're currently with like have to get to these ones mm-hmm. like that's where we would go and I want to know how that was going to happen but eventually like the plots would connect and then it would be some big revelatory thing and my siblings would look at me like oh my gosh you had this thought out the whole time I'm like yeah yeah and I was like sure yeah uh, and I think that eventually started lending itself to you know I, I remember very fondly going like classic story like going to Universal Studios at a young age I think like third grade and just um you know taking taking the studio tour and being like wow like like people can do this people can make these things and um my grandpa at the time like giving me his his video camera his older video camera and just starting to kind of adopt that into making movies with my siblings and you know realizing really quickly that the the stuff that we could pull off with toys was a little harder to like pull off with with us um but that started leading to writing and I really got into theater and while I liked acting um in high school like I I much more enjoyed like uh what if this what if the script was was a little different or like like what was happening off off camera or off off panel and um so I would start kind of writing those little things as jokes with friends like behind the stage and get in trouble with my drama teacher because we would not be hitting our cues because we would be filming our own like random side stories and uh, so I think that got me into to improv and writing. And I was doing a lot of like kind of journalism writing um, for for school papers and local papers, but they were always very story focused and much more editorial than I think I, you know, was supposed to be for writing the the student team beat. Um, but those started transforming more and more into like early, early screenplays and early stories that um I met one of my best friends is a guy named Eric uh we we just realized very early on that we started like we enjoyed writing together and we enjoyed making each other laugh and so Eric is still one of my like go-to writing partners that we're constantly working on stuff together and he's down in LA and does a lot of um improv and sketch comedy stuff in in that scene down in Orange County in LA but uh I think those those are some of my earliest yeah scripts. So my writing partners changed from siblings to to myself to to my friend yeah. Eric. Well, I mean that's so cool too. The process of like starting with action figures and like <clears throat> I wonder if that translated to your writing in a way too. Like you you knew where the characters were in the beginning. You knew kind of at the end, but you kind of figured out the journey. You know, in the middle. That's kind of like kind of my writing style in a way. I know the beginning of the movie, know the end, but yeah, kind of figuring out the middle. I think so. I think in a lot of ways, what really changed the game for me with with writing in my 20s and kind of that second awakening that happened um, once I started teaching was I, I swear by outlining mm-hmm. like like so much when writing a story. I I usually if I if I'm going to find out and figure out, like, is this idea worth its salt? Like, is this something that I want to pursue? I really won't open up final draft until I have even for a short if I can't make it work as an outline and that's not sticking to, I'm, I love, 
I love story structure. I love uh, Joseph Campbell. I love thinking of those things in these different ways. Sorry, my dog also loves Joseph Campbell's story structure. Um, <laughs> cool. But um, I, I like outlining and I like outlining. And originally, I think college taught me first to like do the, you know, ordinary world, call to adventure, refusal of the mm-hmm. call. But as I've gotten older, that shifted even more. And especially after directing, like, like scene by scene, what's the game of the scene? What's the, what's the wants and the objective? How is it moving it forward? If it's not like, do we need it? Can we say things? And so, so that, that is how I write. So usually I have, you know, a concept or a premise. And the first test is like, can I break this down into a log line? Like, does this work that, that way? And it, it sounds so basic, but it truly is. It's like, you know, is this a vibe or a story? I, I think mm-hmm. there's const there's a, there's a meme on some like writing thing right now. It's the Daniel Craig from knives out where it's like, when I have a new story idea, but I don't know what it's about. And he's like, but it compels me. And it's, <laughs> yeah. it, it is, it's kind of that thought, but if I can get it down on an outline, it's also a lot easier to revise and like go through, you know, in a, an eight page outline versus the, you know, 120 page feature. Sure. And so I, I, you know, I just saw today the short film that you co-wrote. Oh um, yeah. Yeah. Here's the plan. Right. Yeah. Uh-huh. It was really good. You know, Thanks, for some reason, like yeah. it's so quick of a turnaround. That was the whole, you know, project itself, right. It had to be filmed in 48 hours. It had to be filmed like from, I think, so that was through the Rooster brothers company, Agbo. They, so they put out the premise, I think it was like 6 p.m. on a Friday night. And so I got on a call with uh, another one of my director friends, Brian Ulrich, and the producers that he had got on. And so we knew they had a location. We knew they had these few actors attached. But once the the premise was released and it had to do with um, time. time manipulation, yeah. um, literally what the process that I just described was like what that was with them too where I was like hey here's kind of the log line that I'm thinking what do you guys think about that and then I worked with a uh, wonderful writer named Jenna Wyckoff and together we like the two of us did exactly what you and I are doing right now we zoomed um, but it started with that that outline premise that basically as we took notes and pitched and talked through and then that was super helpful and I think why we were able to write it in about two hours was because Jenna and I then took the outline that I had made and then just divided it up. When do you focus on character? You So I know you focus on structure now. When does yeah. you know character come into play for you? I think they kind of go hand in hand. Um, I think so for this short film, for example, and this is something I'm trying to think. I, I read a lot of comics. I read a lot of comics. Like that is probably my, I, I love movies. I love TV shows, but like, um, comics and like books that are coming out that kind of keeps me going you can probably see behind me like my st- my stacks of books figures. on each side <laughs> action figures oh. comics um but i think something that i learned from a lot of comic writers especially that are dealing with characters that are you know 60 years old and have have complicated histories is like you know in each in each panel in each page you can have the craziest plot mechanics in the world but like if if you if you can't recognize the characters or can't recognize something at heart, like why, why do we care what the X-Men are doing? Why do we care what the, you know, the, the sci-fi horsemen of the apocalypse are running into uh, unless they're like, are they having sibling issues? Like, are they all mad at their dad? Like, sure. like, do yeah. they, do they kind of want that? And so I feel like even with this, like one of the first things, and then I don't know how, thorough it ended up feeling inside the actual short but like my main premise was like there's siblings that are robbing a bank like that was something that I was like okay like let's have it be a brother sister thing um and let's let that kind of drive what's going on um and so even with with drive back my my feature I didn't I didn't write it the script was written by uh, a friend of mine named John Sorrow and so John sent it to a company called Rotting Press. Rotting Press brought it to Tremendum. Tremendum brought it to me. And so one of the biggest learning experiences of my life was then taking John's original script and Drive Back is about a um, an engaged couple. They're driving back from their engagement party and they get lost on this road. 
and they start kind of seeing the same thing again and again. Um, we realize that there's kind of some arguments and conflicts between the two of them. And then they get out of the car to figure out what's going on and things get worse from there. When working with John over that summer, like that was a big, a big conversation that we had where it's like the plot structure of that script didn't really change from, from the time that I first read it to, to actually filming. And now even in the edit, like John's basic bones of the script, like the structure was there, the rules, the rules of like how, how this mysterious shortcut worked are there. Um, the, the plot twists are there instead. What John and I really focused on is like, who, who is this couple at the center? Like what drives them? What are they about? And for me, that just made any of the, um, any of the structure beats even, even cooler, um, even, even more interesting because we're like, Oh, Hey, like this adds another layer because this character we've now explored that they like this or they have this interest or this background. Um, and I, so, so for me, I, I feel like not to have a cop out answer Matt, but it, like, it kind of works together where it's like the structure comes, but I also definitely subscribe to the philosophy of like, I feel like especially in features more so than TV shows, like, you know, you're a feature is kind of, a, it's a pocket world. It's, it's, it's a pocket world. It's a pocket reality, this story that like everything that exists in that story, like in your feature from production design to some sort, like hopefully services the, the, the character's perspective or their point of view or that world. And so I feel like when you're sometimes coming up with a premise or you're coming up with a story, like the character the character goes with with the plot with the structure and so like hopefully their wants and desires will come into you know into conflict with what's going on and that kind of helps shape like i don't want this cool thing just to happen i want the character to get something out of it if that if that makes sense or that's just nonsense i don't know no it totally makes sense i mean if that's yeah. something that i you know would openly say that i struggle with would be um would be you know character backstory you know creating this character because i don't want to be so on the nose where this character's backstory is related to the plot you know and mm -hmm. then it's like well i don't want to create all this stuff that doesn't matter <laughs> you know what i mean also so it's like i want to be intentional but like i find you, you got to find that middle ground i suppose i think i think something that i really and i think we talked about so we did this we did this workshop and and for the listeners who aren't familiar like basically what we were given at the workshop was like we were given a script and then we were given our performers. I think something that really stood out to me from that and, and stood out to me from directing this feature is it's like your, your actors bring a lot to the table. Your, your actors and your performers, like they are bringing in their whole interpretation mm -hmm. to your screenplay as well. And so I think that's been something really interesting as, I've, as I'm writing. It's my writing partner, Eric, and I, we really challenge ourselves when introducing characters it's like, how can we say anything that we need to about these characters and like two adjectives and that's it. Like, yeah. and after we say that, hopefully the dialogue speaks for itself. Hopefully the decisions do, but like, you know, as a direct, you might know who you're going to cast, but you might, you might have no idea. And like, if you're, a, if you're a gun for hire, like you might not get that choice at all. You might inherit a cast and you might inherit those decisions. And so I guess in trying to write, it's still trying to create a, a honestly kind of like a Rorschach test of like you're giving it to a performer and I feel like a good casting happens and a good director actor relationship happens when you're both looking and you're seeing the same image sure like when you yeah. both look at the screenplay and it's like oh wait like how do you feel about this character yeah I think he's self-conscious about this too how are we going to like you know actionably and objectively show that um I think that's when you start to see that magic happen. For sure. And so you touched on a little bit with um, the collaborative process between, you know, you and the the writer of yeah. the feature film, you know? And so I would love to dive into, you know, those, you know, those, those moments of just everything working together seamlessly, but also any conflicts that might've arose, you know, and then how you even navigate those yeah. issues. So I've been, I've been writing personally for, for the past the past decade I think has been I would say like that's now my like adult writing career and so it was I've been on the on the other side of the table for notes from a director for a long time like mm -hmm. oh, I don't know about this or what about this or what about this or you know the classic like 
I don't know if you've seen this as a writer, but it's like, you you know, you turn in your script and you'll get notes back. It's like, did they even read this? Like, did they read this or no? Like, I think that that kills me sometimes where it's like, mm, these are not notes based on my story that I submitted. These are notes based on like what they still have in their head. Um, and so I really did not want to do that when I, when I was working with our writer. And I think it was one of those things where it was so, so interesting being on the other end of the table to be the one giving notes, to be the one guiding, to do that. I, I think I'm learning, uh, of how to, as we all are as humans, like learning how to communicate and how to communicate clearly. But I, I'm not sure if this comes from my teaching background or, you know, just maybe not, not being passive, but like, I, I want the other creators that I'm working with. I want them to get to those decisions versus like, like, I, I hate, I hate giving line reads, right? Like I, I hate telling an actor, like, actually, I need you to say it like this. I, I, I hate you. Like, like that's, I'm like, I'm not the actor. You're the actor. Like I'm the director. I'm going to try and help get you there. Um, and so I felt the same way with writing where it's like, I am going to, I wanted to guide and I wanted to like talk about what I found interesting about the script um, and John, but I'm also like, John, John wrote this, like John, John was the one who wrote this from, from his experiences and his interpretations. And, and so it's one of those, but it was interesting, like essentially the script is like, this isn't spoiler alert, but like the script is kind of a big metaphor for like maybe a bad breakup. And like a couple that that is talking through a lot of their a lot of their dirt while trapped in a car together. Mm -hmm. And it's like John and I were talking about that. And he's like, yeah, you know, like you have you have these breakups and you're with someone and maybe there's something keeping you together, but you shouldn't. And I'm like, yeah, I get that. And I'm like, I've also like in college, I I. I broke up with a girl while we were driving back from Colorado together and then mm. still had to stay in the car together. And I, and so like that, that ticking time bomb, I'm like, and in the course of that car ride, like we got back together and broke up again, like three more times. And, and so, but it was like one of those things where, so I'm telling John this and he's like, Oh, that's, that's, you know, that's actually, that's really interesting. And that's really good. And, um, John, John is single and I'm married and now I'm, you know, bringing in some of my own, like, fears about my own future and my wife's future and what that will look like. And John's bringing in stuff from very recent hurt. And so I think finding a synthesis of those things together is, is cool, but it, it also does lead to, it does lead to conflict. And I think that's one of the things where like, you know, for our film, we had about, we had about three different endings where we're like, this could happen, this could happen, this could happen. And I think we would end up on opposite sides. And I think that was where it did get to start to be my kind of prerogative as, as a director and, you know, hopefully right, hopefully right to like the heart of the story. But like, um, I've also, you know, I've seen stuff that I've made uh, or that I've written get made and be like, that doesn't feel like what I wanted that to be. That doesn't feel like what I wanted. And I feel like it's just, it's, you have to be honest to your, your version of the story and hope that the best that the best idea or best version even if it's not yours will will be what comes out on screen yeah what serves the story best yeah I love that too yeah and that's such a, a delicate balance too because you know as the director it is you know it's it, you know all the decisions ultimately land on you you know to to need to make either whether they're good or bad you know I, I think that's it whether they're good or bad yeah it's yeah. it's still it's on you once that the action happens and the edit happens and um, obviously the producers play a huge role in that, but just, uh, I'm honestly very thankful that my first feature gets to be something that obviously I got to like kind of rewrite it and rework it with John. But like, I'm very glad that my first thing that I directed was not, was not something that I was like extremely precious over the, the over the source material or story. Like it wasn't my own, um, because, because I felt honestly, like, I felt like I had more of a responsibility to like serve mm. the scrape the script the script faithfully and like with an act of fidelity because it was servicing John's story and it was servicing the story that the that the producers like agreed to um and really trying to do like okay what is what is this how does this exist in this world versus when it's sometimes your own things I don't know if you find this like you know you can be a bit more 
fluid or or if you're like ah like or or a bit more stubborn depending on what the what the story is and i think this allowed me to like uh, can i be faithful to this script even if things change the day of yeah no that is great because i mean as a writer director if you're doing you know if you're directing a project that you've written you know you've had those specific daydreams of a specific you know of a specific yeah. shot or a scene mm -hmm. or however it goes and so you could be a bit stubborn on you know getting those specific you know shots but yeah something that you said too um how your own personal experience you know with the breakup in the car literally <laughs> you know yeah you know uh, it's it's kind of hilarious how um life situations like that we can you know harness and apply to work i think that's one of the things that always makes makes what we do feel like it matters like in the same way where when you know you're watching a movie and you have that emotional reaction and you're watching a play and you see you know a child over a few rows down like gasp for the first time it's like like those are other people's real experiences that are put in and like you know we can hopefully empathize with them and add to it and so I was watching a cut of of drive back with my wife a few weeks ago and she she like started laughing at like a pretty serious part. And I was like, okay, well, I failed. Like this is, this is my worst nightmare come to life. But she, I was like, what's up? Like, what, what do you think is so funny? She's like, this is like, this is us. Like we've had this conversation and it sounds like she's like how your, how your character is responding is like, is how you respond. She's like, was that you? And I'm like, I don't know. Like, I, I don't remember now. Like, I don't remember if that was, you know, Zach, our actor, just channeling what he how it was written or if that was me and John writing that early on kind of kind of a little more dismissive but uh but it was and it was something that was very drawn from my own like trying to communicate something not feeling heard her not feeling heard and that conflict that comes from that yeah. and bringing that to the table but it's like Zach our actor is also bringing that to the table from his own conversations with his wife our actress wit is bringing that with her conversations John our writer our cinematographer is trying to film it from a certain lens and so it's just a uh, there's so much that goes into it with that collaboration so you interpret the story but now visually communicate it as the director so it's like switching off you know screenwriting mode and you know not so much thinking about well I mean you still think about character and themes and all that stuff but now visually you know so what was that process like? I think that was a really, um, I think that has honestly been the part that has made me most, I think this is why it took me so long to to admit that I wanted to direct was exactly what you're describing, where it's, um, it's really easy to write these things and write these themes and have these back and forths, but showing stuff visually, which, you know, the whole medium of film is, um, was something that I was really nervous about. And so fortunately, I was very, I was very thankful and very, very fortunate to have a skilled um, DP, uh, a guy named Lucas Patasi, who had already done several, several other features, like kind of in this same, um, same ballpark, like, you know, a, a two hander couple talking about relationship, dealing with dealing with fear, dealing with lots of different things and stuff like that. And um, was really interesting about this time is like, I went from talking with the writer John every day to then talking with Lucas every day. Um, and so Lucas and I went through the entire, the entire script and we would have, you know, these similar conversations and he would ask really good questions of like, what are you trying to communicate during this? And so we would, we would, we would break down the scripts like shot by shot, shot by shot and go through. And, you know, that was, that was a great crash course for me um, into talking about coverage, talking about setups, talking about what we would need and, you know, drastically not over planning, but then you, you get, and then you get to the day of, and then all of a sudden you change from like talk, spending all your waking moments talking from, you know, talking with the writers to then talking with the DP to then talking with the AD to, to make sure that things are going. And then the AD saying like, Hey, guess what? Like we, you, we literally don't have time for this because like the sun is going down and we're not coming back here. And it's like, yeah yeah like yep. And, <laughs> yeah you're right you are correct and it's like you're not you're not being you're not being a jerk like we have to move on um and so then realizing and and going back to Lucas, be like do we have what we need to to communicate this scene do we have what we need to be able to cut to and have the effect of that like and it, it's it's a lot it's it's a lot and it's a lot of going through but it's it's once again i'm trying to go back to that whole theme of like like trusting my team 
um, and trusting those around me where it's like, like everyone else wants to serve as the story. And if there's ever any clashing, I feel like of, you know, of egos or personality, it's, it's, it's all because everyone's wanting, like, I want this part to be the best, like, you know, the actor, the actor asking for another take, even though you're like, oh, we gotta go, we gotta go, like, is because they're like, I think I can give a little more to serve that best, you know. For sure. Um, the deep, the DP saying, hey, like, I don't know about that shot. Like, can we try this a little different, or do you mind if I raise the camera or lower it? It's like they're they're trying to get what's best for that story too. But it's like your your goal as the director is to is to hear that though, but then to be like, I want like. Like, I want you to trust me and think like, you know, telling the performer, like, I got what we need. Like, yeah. like you look great and we're going to be okay. Um, and then moving on from there. So visually, there's a lot of like pre-scouting the location. A lot of ours takes place in a car and in in the woods. And so um, spent a lot of time in the mountains and a lot of time in a, a Toyota Corolla. Um, but I think even then it was like, how do we make some of these conversations look you know, look cinematic and how can we convey the emotion still without feeling like this, this driving is getting boring. And and I yeah. think really, but, but then even more cyclical than that, like it, it still came back to the script. It still came back to like, what, what is happening plot wise or character wise. And something that I'm really proud about how the movie feels is like every three minutes, like it's something's changing something, but the, the dynamic is shifting the conversation excuse me, the conversation is revealing more and more the plot is going. And so it felt like that kind of influenced things visually too, is that it feels, it feels really kinetic. Yeah. Um, and I, I liked that a lot. And and we had a really, Lucas and I, just the, the view of the film, we had a really thoughtful conversation of like, we wanted it to feel a bit more, a bit more studio and a bit more locked down early on. Uh, because we knew so much and that, that's where we have a bit more gliding we have a bit more moving it, it feels very a lot more classical um, but then on the car like we're we're moving the camera with with the car as it's car mounted and then from there once we start getting into the woods it's a lot more uh, it's a lot more steady cam it's a lot more flowy it's a lot more and then by the end it's 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 chaotic and it's moving and so being able to help communicate the themes and the breakdown of it um, worked really well with a, a solid team something really quick that you said about about characters so you were talking about how to get like the audience to kind of fall in love with the character be close with the character you know yeah and um you know obviously right now in tv you have siri you have multiple seasons to do that you know a film you have you know two hours and mm -hmm. a short film you have such a short amount of time and so you know for the short film that you just um co-wrote on you know yeah. i was you know i was tearing up there at the end i'm you know? so glad yeah <laughs> like really yeah um and so that is kind of just an exercise in itself. How do you make people, you know, fall in love with these characters in such a short amount of time? I think it's the the bullshit writing answer is like, you know, make them human. But I think the real way is really just like, um, you know, no one wants to watch statues. No one wants to just hear these like, um, like sometimes we do like, but like even even Nolan, you know, as he's working on Oppenheimer or something like that, like you don't just want to hear these philosopher kings like, you know, shout, shout theses back at each other. Like you want to, for me, especially in writing, like I feel like I want to hear them stutter. I want to hear them repeat the same thing. I want to hear them, ah, mm, what about, wait, hold on. Like I want to hear them cut each other off and be imperfect. And so I feel like you can do that in dialogue to show a lot. During our break, actually, I texted the director of the of the short and was like, "Hey, like, got some really good notes on on the short." And he was saying how much he uh how much he liked. I was saying how much you liked the character, um, and it was one of those things where he messaged back too. He's like, "Yeah, like you guys have been writing," and it's like the actors brought so much too. And I was like, "Yeah." I, so I, I guess that's the biggest part is like directing a feature taught me so much that the the prep work is real and i know that sounds super like basic and naive but i'm not even talking about that in regards to like like make sure your locations are there make sure your your shot lists are done like yeah obviously but making sure that you did the work with your, your script um is is so key uh and so i think that was something that was so big and like by the time that the actors got it like they they even saw a few versions of it and we're able to talk about like oh hey i like this better i like what this is becoming more and more but like they're trusting that they're going to bring energy to it and and trusting that it's okay for audibles the day of like i just I, there's a few scenes in particular even in drive back and 
where based on the location or how the blocking ended up feeling where they're like, do I have to say this line? Like, can I say this instead? And I'm like, yeah, like that's, that's, that's better. Like that's better. It, it sounds more natural coming from you and you are who the audience is going to see on the characters. So like try the, try the other reading and do that. And, and I don't think that, you know, if you're, if you're not confident in your script, if you're not confident in your characters, and I think there's a difference between being like, like this version of the script, whether that's like, I, Oh my gosh, now I'm rambling, but it's like, I hate writing like, um, I hate even writing like um, a POV of in a script or like, like from a bird's eye view, we see like, even, even knowing I'm directing. Cause once you get to that, you might realize like we had a few scenes that we had shot listed out maybe eight or nine different shots. And then in the actual scene, and now what we're actually using in the edit we ended up getting it in two shots just because the performances were that good and communicated so much more about the character than like cutting to an insert, cutting to the reaction of the insert, cutting to an extreme close up. And instead it's like, you know, the character talks about it and then looks like that was all we needed. And so I feel like that was kind of a learning experience too, of like, see the movie in your head, like be faithful to that while you're on set and like, directors directors viewfinders are great because it's also a trip because it literally feels like you're watching your show like on netflix or something like oh, while you're filming where it's like oh cool like this looks real this is oh, sick sure. um yeah. but uh but being okay to be like do i need that or or can we move on um for sure can i trust the actors with the character yes learning like less is more in certain you know aspects and yeah all of that you were saying, you know, you have a specific vision of how a scene goes out, you know, even shot listed it out, but you have to be, it's so, it's that dynamic that we have to be in, you know, we have to have yeah. this plan set out and then the ability to just throw it out, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, totally, you know, totally. You know, like you, you were able to at least keep, you know, certain shots that you had planned already, but yeah. I'm sure you have, you know, examples of when you're like, okay, well, this isn't going to work. Scratch all of that. That's now, now we have five minutes to create something. So, so our opening scene um, of Dreadback, it takes place at, at this engagement party for this couple. And we had this beautiful, beautiful cabin, like up in the Sequoias and Lucas and I and our, our production team and everything, we went there and we, it was really cool. Some of the most prep work that we did, and we thought for such an important scene, let's do it. And so we went through and we, we shot list, we blocked and we he actually got to have visuals for this whole opening sequence, which was super cool for this beautiful cabin, these giant windows. And so that was so awesome because we were able to literally like frame the shot specifically for the location in a way where we're like, this is, this is, this is amazing. Like, like when else are we going to get this opportunity? And then we got snowed out of the location. Um, and so the location was literally unreachable the week that we needed to go film that. And so, two days before and it was the last thing during principal photography that we needed to get we had to we had we had to find a completely new cabin a completely new location and so all of our all of our prep work all based on literally having things blocked out like meant nothing um and so we had to to recalibrate and recalculate and what went from a very large open concept cabin was now kind of a smaller resorty cabin uh, that had a, a really cool outside patio and deck. And then we realized we're like, I think we need to showcase this more. Okay. How can we change some of the production design? Because all of that was based for inside or for this like outside near this fire pit. And so we, um, we had, we had to recalculate everything. We had to change yeah. everything up and, you know, we had a really, uh, cool idea, um, and, and structure for how we thought this, this scene would flow, um, that we had to just completely abandon. And so now I think I honestly, it is one of those things where it's like, I, I, I think this scene is really strong though. Yeah. Um, I think it's like, we had, we had to adapt on the day of, we had to switch things up. It looked completely different than, you know, John had written it. Then I had blocked out and storyboarded but it ended up being like, I think exactly what it needed to be. Um, and I think early on, it like still serves its purpose. And so the the scene itself, because the location is now like, the scene is in a different order than written because it's almost kind of like these mini like uh, scenelets mm -hmm. of, of different things happening at this engagement party. Um, but because the location changed and because some of our like our, our money shots 
couldn't exist anymore we had to change the format and i think it just made the whole thing stronger because of it but that was yeah. wild that was that was definitely like i'm like what a way to go out and we had you know like 40 40 extras arriving that wow. day and that just like okay. <laughs> had every you know with our our assistant director had already blocked where everything was going to go and so our biggest day ended up being our most like on the fly racing against the clock day which i feel like is usually how it goes sure but how awesome though being you know optimistic i know that's the way to be you know in this world <laughs> in this filmmaking world of ours right yeah but you know that it truly you know served the story right that yeah you know, this wild change that you had no idea was going to happen and in a way because you were able to adapt and you know recalculate and recalibrate you know so quickly you know, that just shows strength, right? In everybody's collaborative, you know, effort, their passion into the film, you know, the strength of everybody in their yeah, skill set to really still pull it off, but not only just pull it off to make it the best it could be for that situation. Yeah. And I, and I think so. And I think that was something that was a true testament to our team was that like yeah. everyone was willing to, and I feel like honestly, like you have, you have to be, if you're doing indie film, like you have to be, if you're, if you're doing something like there's just kind of an understanding of the scrappy nature. And I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not condoning it nor condemning it. I'm just kind of saying like, that's, that's kind of how it is. Like, like if you're trying to make something for a micro budget that still feels like it's, it's not like not even in a cutting corners way, like stuff like this happens and you're just going to have to, to try to find a way to adapt if you, if you want your thing to get done. Yeah. You know, like one of the things I wanted to ask you was how do you deal with rejection and failure? So, I mean, that could have been a moment of failure. You yeah. Know? But it's just the resilience to just keep going and, and adapting. Uh, so is that, the, is that the question now? Rejection and failure? <laughs> sure. Let's talk about it. Yeah, we've, been, we've been talking for an hour. We can get into this now. I'm comfortable let's enough. Let's get into it. Yeah. Um, rejection and failure is super real. And it is just, it is such a part of, of what we do do i don't know if it ever gets easier and it's there from the very beginning i think it's uh what's what's super crazy about rejection and failure in film is one it's it's obviously hard and i think it's it's it it can get even harder on set no i know the dog also agrees um but i think what's important to realize is it's not you necessarily getting rejected like especially if it's an idea thing it, it and if you're truly approaching it as like like ego suck ego suck on set um, and so, you know, if you tell someone, actually, I don't know about that. And if they get huffy, like, it's like, I'm not telling you, no, I'm saying like, I don't think we should do that. Like, let's, let's try a different thing. Um, I think when approaching is like, what, what can we do that's best for the story versus like, you don't like my idea, which means you don't like me, which like, yeah. you know, it's, it's crazy how quickly, you know, when, when insecurities are real, like we go back to that elementary school attitude. Of, of just like like they don't want to play with me or you know when submitting scripts to to contests or festivals or you know uh, doing doing writing submissions for projects and just it not landing or not going like not not taking stock in that of like I can't do it because a script that Eric and I have had that we've always really believed in it's a project called um called Mystic and Eric my writing partner is um he's he's Hmong American and so we essentially we wrote this really cool um, like kind of in the vein of of Buffy, the Vampire Slayer, Smallville, but like for kind of a more of a modern streaming audience called Mystic about this um, Hmong American teen boy who inherits his grandma's ability to like sense the supernatural and have to bring balance kind of like classic like monster of the week teen teen drama that we're like, this is cool. And we think this is important and it's personal and it's like all of this stuff. And we would place really like really well in multiple contests and on like the, the writing website cover fly, I think the script is still in like the top 2%. Mm -hmm. And, but you know, it's like, even after getting that, when we would not win or we would not go to that next level, we would feel really like really crappy and really like, what are, like, what's wrong? Is, are we yeah. wrong? Are we this? But then finally, you know, you get a call or you get something. What's, what's wrong with this? What's wrong with the script? But then you realize someone else is like, Hey, this is something that we want right now. Or like, we want to do this. We want to see this. And so now that project got um, picked up by, by a company and we've been working with them to, to kind of get that, that story out there in some shape or form. 
but it's like the story didn't change from one contest to the next. Like it was the same mm-hmm. thing. It just like, it hadn't found its right audience yet. Mm-hmm. And I think it's kind of like the optimistic version of me is like, it's kind of like dating where it's like, you're just not going to click with everyone in the same way that people have other preferences. Like I even have friends as I'm, you know, they know I'm doing this movie and they're very excited for me and stoked for me, but they're like, yeah, I don't know if I'm going to watch your movie. Cause I don't like horror. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> like I get it. I get it. Um, like that's, that's fine. Um, but that same thing happens when we're doing submissions or when we're doing stuff, like you're, you're not going to be everyone's flavor nor should you be. Um, and I think, that is a lot easier to say on a podcast than, you know, than believe when I'm like, you know, rejected for my fifth job in a week or like submitting a script and just never hearing anything back. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think it's, I think the rejection part is really, really difficult and it, and it's, it's wearing. Um, I've had a lot of friends, obviously, as I'm sure you have, and as, as we've been like affected by the strikes right now. Mm -hmm. And I was talking with someone this past week and basically is like the hard part about this industry is it's like, you have so many great and talented and skilled people that one by one, like you, you just have to outlast and you have to be like kind of the last one standing. Cause like it beats you up. It beats up your heart. It beats up your soul. It beats up your, your own belief in yourself and success this is like that too. Like, I just even think like, you know, I finally, I directed a feature. Like I, I did the thing that 10 year old me would not have believed. And it was the most self-conscious that I've ever been like this past year, this past year has been like a, uh, almost like a try to get back my confidence tour of, of just like, even as I was writing new things, I was like, Oh, is this good? Is this actually filmable? Like, do I trust this? Do I like this? Like in a way that I had not felt since I was probably in like, you know, early twenties and striking out as, you know, as a, as a PA or writing assistant of like, how long can I keep doing this? And so I think that's the weird part too, where it's like that success is, is kind of like the flip side of failure because it is almost like, well, I did this once is this going to be good? Will I get a chance to do that again? And obviously like my film hasn't come out yet. I hope I do. Like, I really want to, like, I think that I'm was sure the, you biggest, yeah. the biggest point is like, like, do I, do I get to direct again? Do I get to try again? Like, cause there's, there's so many things I want to do better. There's so many things that I want to do that. And I think that's another hard part with this is it's like, and going back to the the director's lab, thanks, Pam, second shout out of the episode, but it's like, you know, her whole premise for this director's lab that you and I did, Matt, was like, like, as a director, you don't get a chance to practice this unless you're doing it. You don't get a chance to like, to hone any of these skills unless you're on set. And that's, that's hard. That's hard yeah. to, to keep those things fresh and going. Um, failure, failure is hard. Failure is scary. It's, it's one of those things too. Like, you know, I'm, I'm like, I'm like, am I going to have to like get rid of the internet when my movie comes out? Cause I like, don't want to know reviews or thoughts or any, like, I'm like, what, what is that going to be like? Um, because you put so much of yourself, so into much it. of yourself right. into it. Yeah. And it's so, and I'm excited and it's at a place where I'm like, I'm liking it. I, I want people to see it and I want to know. And like, you know, I'm, I'm someone I go see a movie, whether I like it or not, like I'm online. I want to be a part of the discord course I want to read every article that I can I want to hear smarter people than me talk about the themes that they noticed and you know see what I picked up on and um I wanted to, I hope I hope that similar conversations happen happen with all of my work because that's like that's what's exciting to me is is yeah. you know people engaging but the the fear of failure is very real and I think it's um I, I, yeah I think that's that's part of it is like the rejection and the failure and it's a roller coaster of emotions. It's, it's, too, a, it's man. such a roller coaster of emotions. Yeah. I mean, yeah. from being such at a high point. I mean, even just the roller coaster of the production process itself, mm-hmm. right? And the the emotions and everything that you go through, which we'll touch on a little bit later. <clears throat> but the that high of like you said, you know, accomplishing something that your 10-year-old self would have, you know, freaked out over. Yeah. You know, and then that next day, I mean, you still go to bed that night, wake up the next morning and it's like, all right, now yes. what, you know? Now what, now what, yeah. Like, yeah, this ever and en- never ending like drive, which is great, you know, because there really is like no finish line. There's no like, you know, you haven't learned everything you could. You know, there's constantly something new to learn. There's constantly something new to do. 
GQ just had one of their cover stories last week or not last month on uh, Martin Scorsese. Yeah. And it was just talking to him. This guy's, this guy's 83, I think. And he's still talking. But this is, you know, obviously one of the undisputed like masters of cinema in our lifetime and ever. And is still talking about how he's trying stuff new on set how he's how he's still like it's like yeah i hope this story connects i hope it makes it work like i'm trying things i've never done i'm like i think that is that is the goal and i feel like anything that you're doing is like not to be complacent not to settle not to feel like you can't learn because if if martin freaking scorsese is still saying like i'm not the best i can be like i want to keep going like and (laughs) i think any person who's even you know trying to make a film like can still shoot towards like I want to be better the next time I want this to be even easier or like like I I I now know how to do a scene like this or I now know what difficulties are there so like what to anticipate in advance I think that's I think that's the goal and I feel like that's the stuff to learn from like there's a few days on set like they they felt like failure days the shots are still in the film like like they're they're it, it's looking good but you know as as a first time director there was days where i would i'd be like we didn't make our day like we're still missing some of these shots like like i i hope that we can get them we we need to find them like i didn't feel like i had all the answers that i needed because things change like ah but then like you said you get up and you do it again the next day yeah. and and you you have to but it's even during those days like you know i i minimally experienced when i did this mini series recently you know, those days <laughs> I think I think, you, I think you super experienced that based on your your work schedule for that. I'm like, I know, God. so I'm very self diminishing. I know. <laughs> um, <and laughs> I'm like, it was our, no, it was yeah, it was terrible, but um, <laughs> quite like a learning 14, experience. 14, 15 hour days every yeah, day. Yeah, a lot yeah. of fun. Um, but you know, those days of you know, you're freaking out inside, but you cannot show that you know you can't show it yeah yeah and so that whole it's like it goes beyond like what people think of just you know yeah we make we do our director's homework is what i call it you know the you know shot lists and the planning and all of that but suddenly you're a psychologist on set too you know not just in terms of you know characters and but now you're balancing all of these people's egos yes you know and there's so much that goes into it yeah it's like you're um you're a psychologist but you're also like a uh your human resources department too like you're you're building complaints you're you're helping with others you're working with people and you're like you're communicating all of that while still trying to like keep your own sanity and i think that's what's so wild is it's like you you're not you're not bad mouthing anyone you know like like other people will come to you sometimes to be like oh this is going really rough and it's because of this department it's like yeah all right ha 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 like no it's not like it's just because everyone's working so hard and it's it's, it's like freezing degrees out here and yeah. and so you do you you have to you have to wear so so many hats and I think something that I really found and this is like I say all of this thinking like this was my first time and this is learning is like everyone else has a department the actors have each other it can be a little lonely with what Mm -hmm. you're doing it can it can feel a little isolating because you're you're fielding and you're the point person and you're the conversation for everyone but also like also no one once it's in the once it's in the department and like you know others can shut off some people can shut off between takes and just wait for their next moment can go back to the trailer can go sit down for a bit like you know as the as the director and a a lot of department heads too like you're you're on kind of the whole time like you like you you kind of have to be like focused and and tuned in like you said until you go to bed that night and then get up (laughs) and then get up and do it again and even in, in that, you know, aspect too, you know, I had to, you know, separate myself from, you know, some people that tried to keep me up so late so I could kind of, you know, yes. plan and prep the next day. And even then, you know, like, you know, everybody would be asleep and I would finally have the entire, you know, place that we were shooting in for, for myself. And so I would be able to actually go through and walk and around prep the shots. Yeah. Good. For the next day, yeah. because again, you know, my, my storyboards and shot lists and planning and all of that were for you know, I'm so used to a horizontal frame. And so once you get to a vertical frame, it's like, oh, <laughs> it's like, no, literally people have to be on top of each other. Yeah. Frame. In so, order to be in the same frame, like this is completely different. Yeah. Yeah. And so it was much, it was a lot of yeah learning experiences on that set as well. Um, do you, uh, do you have set dreams? I had the same dream for like a month after filming. 
like it oh, wouldn't weird. go away and, and while filming too it was literally like the same dream of filming a scene with our actors that like was not in the movie like like the, the scene doesn't exist but it was like it, it always felt so real too and especially like in the week after the film was done and I was back at home I would like I would literally get up in the middle of the night and like tell them to quiet down because like oh wow. my, my wife was sleeping and there no no one's in my room but I'm yeah, like I'm yeah. like shh guys like not now like, don't now like we'll film this we'll film this when there's light out and it was just <laughs> like what am I doing like what what psychotically broken me that like my body can't even relax right now wow. um yeah and I, I I think I read that recently that we just we put so much into these films i mean lack of sleep is one thing too but like our health really diminishes after oh gosh, yeah. the film like we get yes. a lot of people get sick afterwards yeah just because their immune system just drops and it really does take like a physical toll you know i'm sure not just on the director on on all oh, you know oh, on, on so many department heads and yeah yeah, yeah mm-hmm. for sure one thing you know that we touched on a little bit earlier was being vulnerable with your cast yeah. you know and that yeah. was one thing that i i really utilized for that series because i mean you know i'd go up to them i'm like i don't know what what we're doing in this in this shot so i really would love your guys's input on on what to do here so yeah it's trusting them to you know bring what they you know are there to do you mm-hmm. know bring their own uniqueness to it yeah i think um i think one of the main things is is exactly what you're saying is is feeling free to to talk about it like with your cast and with with your others of just like hey like what are you thinking and um realizing that it's okay to to ask questions to help guide that it's okay to to ask um your your team whether that's your producers or your your dps or your editors or anyone like hey what do you think about this like um i think not in like a second guessing yourself but in like a hey like do you want to do you want to double check my work for some of these things in those moments of in those moments of doubt or in those moments of confidence too where you're just like you just want another pair of eyes on it um my producers from Tremendum, Chris and Travis, they're a, they're a directing duo. Um, anytime they direct, they direct stuff together. And I, I have never understood why that would exist so much uh, than, than after directing something solo like this and realizing like, oh, I, I get it. I get why you <laughs> would want another person right there to, to help you out and have your back. Um, I think having a, a network and a support system um, that's outside of what you're doing is super important too. I think mm-hmm. having, whether that's other, other directors, um, that you're able to talk to, um, Ryan, uh, who shot the, the short film that you saw earlier today, like he, he was someone who I reached out to quite a bit and I know him and I really were able to connect cause he's also done another, um, indie, indie film, indie director. And so getting to chat with someone who just understands, like, even right now, like you and I are speaking yeah. the same language, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. Like, <laughs> having that person to talk to you on, on weekends during days off, having, being, being, knowing it's okay to like be vulnerable to, to your, to your spouse or to your partner or to have, you know, I have a really good network of, I have a really good network of friends who are not involved in film at all that I absolutely love and need in my life. Um, because it's just, a it's, it's good talking about it as, as a, as just a, as a job, yeah. um, versus, versus like, versus an identity. And I think mm-hmm. that's been one of the big things. I think where it's like, you know, being someone who's getting to direct films and getting to write versus like, like this is this is who I am. And I know there's there's other flip sides arguments, but it's just like it's it's humbling and it's helpful, um, and definitely makes it feel less um, less self involved, if that makes sense, because you're able to talk to it in the same way that they're talking about. Like, yeah, my kids really kept me up really late before a meeting yesterday. I'm like, okay, like, cool. Like this, this is like, because at the end of the day, like we're making a movie is still like, it's, it's, it's playing with toys with your siblings and it's for someone else to watch. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of big emotions involved and big things and money and high stakes, but like you're giving people lines and asking them to play pretend in front of a camera. Like maybe don't, don't take yourself so seriously. That's so true. Yeah. And like, it's easy to, I mean, if, oh, it's if, so if, easy to do. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, especially during that time when I was filming that series, you did reach out and you offered your phone number, you know, just to be there, you know, a yeah. landing ear, just if I needed to vent or anything. <laughs> I honestly didn't even have the time. <laughs> no, I know. I know. And it's like, and I didn't have the time, like literally the only time I ever talked to anyone, especially we were filming up in the mountains. So we didn't have cell service. And so like, 
you know, occasionally we would get um, internet up for a little bit, but it's like, I'm, I'm, it's 2 a.m. Like it's 2 a.m. Or, or on night shoots, like it's 5 a.m. Like I'm, I need to sleep. Like I'm not calling anyone. Yeah. I like storytelling. I like storytelling in different formats. I, I, like I said, I love, I love comic books. I love art house. I love blockbusters. I just, I like going to the movies. I, I get a little twitchy if I have not been to the film like in a week or so. Oh, like, like, so my wife and I, I think that was one of the things that we early like bonded over was like, we both liked going to the movies together to see all, mm-hmm. all sorts of stuff. And so I will go, I will watch hard horror. I will watch studio comedies. I will, you know, binge watch tv i will wait for episodic things weekly um i i like a lot i i also like extremely nerdy video games and tabletop games i like i like video games i like a lot of different things um that'll allow me to kind of walk in a lot of different worlds in regards to my references which i also really like and so i feel like when i come to something i'm often like I'm slamming different genres together and trying to see what sticks just because I know I I come from that. Um, I think it depends on projects, something that I like to do, something that I think is that is just as important as outlining when writing is um, a reference sheet of, of reference films and citing your mentor texts. So anytime that I'm pitching a project, um, something that I have right along with the outline. So I usually have basically usually a half a page of like, it's also like these films or these comics or these stories and so I'll really intensely like look at look at like other things that are similar enough that worked um I definitely subscribe to the idea of like there's nothing new under the sun like everything that has been said has been around for forever Mm -hmm. we're just putting different twists on it um and so I know for for drive back in particular I knew that like doing low budget and and very relational I was like I knew I wanted to try and riff and reference on some old Sam Raimi films Mm -hmm. I knew that I wanted to to kind of acknowledge uh other other like you know kind of vintage horror that had come before like um Texas Chainsaw and uh Hills Have Eyes and stuff like that Silent Hills like just different things that I'm like and so I'm putting all those down I'm like these are things that I know I'm borrowing from these are things that I know I'm I am are in my mind as I'm doing this mm-hmm. um, and that that changes for each project. And I feel like something that I just enjoy about watching is like, I have, have a wide girth of, of resources to pull from. Um, sometimes that makes me sound insane when I'm like trying to reference something to someone and they're like, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm like, that makes sense. But I can usually find something else in like the Rolodex to pull from. Sure. But that's always Uh, great, though, having that for in terms of like visual communication, too. You know, it's great to have, you know, I mean, that's our job, right? To communicate or to interpret something visually and and, yeah, communicate it, you know, in that sense. You know, that's actually my favorite. I mean, it's a great question for you. What's your favorite moment on set? But for me, mine is that literal like manifestation moment of that vision that you had, you know, coming to life and being captured. Oh, completely. I... My, my favorite moment on set. Yeah, there's probably, there's probably two, there's probably two, uh, two days in particular that really stand out. Um, so like I said, we got snowed out on our location. Um, and so we had to wait and finally finish up, um, photography with basically a round of pickups in June and initial photography was in, uh, November, October, November. And so when we finally finished up in June, basically we had workshopped and we knew literally exactly what shots we still needed to get. And I, um, I outlined the whole thing and like storyboarded them with action figures. Um, I think I saw you post about that. I think, yeah. So I I probably posted about that. So I did the whole thing with action figures and um, the shots that we got are literally like exactly what I had done. And so that was just, that was a really fun way. And that was something where I had finally felt like I had come into my own a little bit more um, by the time that we were all regrouping to literally like finish this fight. Um, it was like, I know exactly what this needs to be. I know how I want it to feel. I know how I want it to flow. And I'm really proud of how that turned out. Um, we did a, we did kind of a, a, a flashback sequence as well that also felt really similar. Um, and it was very cool seeing like, 
like tr- similar to what you're talking about where with both of those scenes it had felt the most like, like like this is specifically the vision that I see for that that I had gotten to be with this process um but there's a there's a sequence in the film where it allowed for a lot of um basically we got to do the same scene kind of like three different ways um, and so it's, it's, it's one of, it's probably one of my favorite sequences in the movie. I'm really happy with just with, with how it's cut together, how it's edited together, how sound, how, like, like it's literally, it's like, it was one of the first things that I got to see in my, that I saw in my head when I was like, this could be the promise of the film. This could mm-hmm. like, this could be it. And, um, that day on set getting to kind of coach the actors and then let them go a little, like a little batshit crazy was was so fun um and it was just it was super rewarding for me it was super rewarding for them um and i think that the the footage and the way that that scene goes together like really speaks for itself i think that was one of the times where i finally felt like i'm like oh like i trusted my instinct i trusted what i was like wanting this to be instead of trying to like force it into something with a lot more like traditional coverage or different things just be like nah i think i think this can work and it did Mm. um was was really fulfilling um was a was a cool a cool thing to see and i think it will i think it'll probably be one of the more like memorable scenes from the film how cool so we were talking a little bit about intuition and like trusting your gut and and all that right and so yeah i would love to know like those specific moments for you even you know why not touch across like all stages of production so do you have any examples of you know pre-production production production, and post so I think pre-production, I think one of the big, big things that we really wanted to do was so much of this, this film, it, it, it focuses on this couple. And so I think casting them was, was key, obviously. Um, but I think there was, there was definitely a moment during the audition process where I feel like I knew my producers knew um, where we just were like, I think this feels like the right, the right two. Um, and they just, they just, the, the chemistry was there between them. I feel like the, the performance that we were looking for, how we wanted the characters to come across was so there. And so I feel like that was one of the first like big gut trust moments of like, yeah, I think these two are it. Um, and so I feel like that was something that, you know, you obviously really want to feel. And especially when so much of your, your story is going to focus on these two, um, that that was a really cool moment for that. The, the pre, pre-production stuff, there's a few twists. There's a few twists that happen in the film that I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm really happy with. And I feel like they, they pull off well emotionally um, that I feel like we, when, when John and I were working on, you know, kind of some revisions of the script, I feel like that was kind of a big focus. Um, and I feel like, you know, we trusted our instincts and I'm really happy with how, how those came across. Production wise, I think the, the instincts of anything that we had to change due to like location swapping um, or a few of the times where we're like, Hey, let's, let's, I think we're good with the coverage that we have, or we can trim this down. Or what if we, what if we stayed on this character? I feel like I'm really happy with how a lot of those scenes have turned out as well. Post-production post is super interesting. Um, Post is super interesting just because now like you can't, you can't hide. You can't hide in post. All of your um, all of your successes, but also all of your like you know your errors, um, are are there. And so looking at all of that and really trying to be like, oh man, like is this going to work? Is this going to go together? And what is that? I think one of the trickiest parts in post, um, usually you you have a pretty good idea on set like what the best performance is going to be and like which take you're going to use and so marking those like I feel like we were pretty consistent with like oh yeah let's use this one let's use this one or let's borrow pieces from this but um, there's a few things that we've cut in post I think that was trusting instinct as well of like hey what do we lose from this like you know so um, we, we've been very grateful for the editors that we've had and my producers also are just very skilled at post-production. And so I know they've been handling a lot of the editing process as well, but there's been certain scenes where we kind of had to start asking ourselves, like, what do we lose if we lose this? And if the answer was nothing or like, Hey, we repeat this later, kind of trusting the instinct to be like, while this was a cool scene or a sequence, like trusting, especially when we're chopping stuff up in act one so that we can get to kind of the, um, the, the central conceit of the story a little faster 
it was one of those like what are we are we losing character moments that like make us bond with the main couple more are we losing character moments that show their relationship more or do we still have enough to to dive into like the meat of the story i think that's been probably the biggest where you have to trust your instinct as a storyteller and as a creator um to to really try to stick to it you know i listen to so many different things about like the main role of the director is like as you're filming this whole entire thing out of order as you're filming on different days with different stand-ins with different crews like is the emotional cadence that you need still there like is it consistent is it does it track and i feel like that's the main thing in the edit too is like does each scene have does it does it start where the last one ended and does it end where the next one needs to start and like how does that work across the whole thing yeah and i feel like yeah i feel like <laughs> like it did it did i feel yeah. like yeah good I'm happy good. without it's turning out that's awesome but the, i mean people don't think about that there's so many things to be consciously aware of you know throughout the entire job and so journey, much you know? yeah yeah and so i mean we've touched on um pre-production a little bit we touched on production you know in terms of like the writer's director's journey mm -hmm. so now in a proposed production let's talk about that a little bit we have now with you know with intuition in you know yeah. how you deal with all that but yeah the whole process of of even now like i'm sure you you're, you're able to input notes you know for editing and all that but you know for the series that i just got um I don't have any input on the editing. So it's like just handing it off and like hoping for the best, <laughs> you know, yeah, I already it's, know it's um, not going to be, you know, what I would have wanted, but you know, oh well. it's, it's, it's definitely, it's interesting. I think it, it becomes such a different collaborative effort. And I think it's been, it's been one of those things for me as, as this kind of like, you know, gun for hire director for, for, for multiple production companies. Like it's, it's really felt like my, my job and the bulk of my job, obviously like the notes, that I'm giving right now, whether that's an audio or soundtrack and like putting it together, like are valued, but like, there's just so much. If you're, if you are not a director that's in the, in the editing booth, you know, with the editors the entire time, like there's, there's going to be decisions made, made without you, right? Like there's going to, like you're saying, like there's going to be decisions that you're going to get back and you're going to see cuts and you're going to, you know, talk and be like, oh, okay, like, was this the best version of that scene? Like, can we take a look through the footage? And it's like, I am, and the, you know, being completely vulnerable, like I, I still work a full-time job when I'm, when I'm, while I'm doing this. And so my, mm -hmm. my producers, this, this is what they do full-time. My editors, this is what they do full-time. And so um, I think it's been, you know, part of that whole self discovery and self journey of, of being okay with like, I'm trusting my team with these decisions in the same way that I trusted my production designer, my DP. And like, we all have the best interest in heart. And like so much of the bulk of my job was getting this footage and getting these performances and making sure that it's all there. And so like, you know, now getting into the edit and seeing these things and giving notes is like, you know, sometimes you're wanting to high five yourself in the past and be like, good job. You did it. And other times you're wanting to like, you know, throw them the middle finger and like you dumbass, like, why, why, why did you say moving on? Um, and then, and then finding workarounds that and other people finding workarounds that, and like, you know, um, highly, highly recommend having producers that are also like VFX pros and are able to like, you know, make some, make some quick changes to be like, yep, that fixes this issue. Um, which has been really, really cool. But um, post post production is interesting. Post production is yeah. interesting. Um, I I went to go visit some friends a few a few weekends ago in Colorado, and they they know what I've been doing for the past year, which is why I've built on seeing them for the past year until finally going to this past weekend. And uh, I was standing by one friend, and several kept asking like like Oh, when's the movie coming out? Like like how's it going? Like what's going on? And so he's been sending me a text like almost every day, like Oh, so when's the movie coming out? Just because you know you hear that answer, and I think that's that's the part that you obviously like you've worked on projects, I worked on projects. Like you know you're not always going to know when something's coming out, but yeah. it it's hard explaining the post production side to people, especially like I had a lot of friends and family that were extras in that uh, engagement party scene that opens the film. And so, so many of them, it's now been a year, I think this weekend since, oh, cool. we, filmed, yeah, since we filmed that scene. And so a lot of them are like, mm. and like, like, yeah. like, like, where is it? And I'm like, oh, it's almost done. They're like, 
I thought it was at this stage earlier. I'm like, yeah, no, it, it's, it's been it, it's been in audio engineering and composing. Like that's not, that hasn't changed, but like that, that takes a while. And like, well, when will it be out? I'm like, I, I don't know. Like, like it's like, I don't know like who, where it's going to sell to or what it's going to look like. And, and that's, that's so beyond me. And they're like, but didn't you direct it? I'm like, <laughs> yeah, but that's, that's but a we just different don't know. game. We just yeah. don't know. Yeah. So but isn't that something so strange to have like such a devotion and like, you know, you care about something so much to where at the end it's like, all right, you just have to like, it's like really raising yeah a child in a it's, way. It's like raising a child. I think what this past, this past stint. So like I said, in June, we filmed in June, we filmed our last round of pickups. But then in August, early September, we filmed our last, last round of pickups. The final, and final. <laughs> the final, final. Yeah, I remember I called our AD um, when we were getting ready to do that. And he's like, what do you, do you remember that rap party we did in June? Like, what, like, what are you doing? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is like, this is like just a few more things. Um, but it was weird because it's like, even though it was in post and the edit and I was giving notes, I was still so obviously hands-on and prepping the shot list and the script and like, you know, coordinating um, and, and indie film, you, you take on such a producing role too, even like, you know, I, I don't have these credits on it, but like I'm, I'm costume designing, I'm prop making, I'm, I'm <laughs> stunt driving, I'm, I'm body doubling. Like I'm doing all of those things as well for my film but now like since we finished that last batch like it it feels like a long distance relationship now where it's like mm -hmm. i still i love this person um i love this project but like you know we're we're checking in like once a week over phone or like you know exchanging emails versus like hanging out every hour in a toxic way like so it's it's just it just switches yeah yeah it's such a weird like change you know yes and it is only momentary right for now until the yeah. film is released and then suddenly you're going to have such a you know a jump in you know people wanting to hire you i'm sure uh, that's what i'm hoping for i think that's that's the weird that's the weird stage right now is just that it is it's kind of this interim like a liminal state that's it is it is it is a true liminal state liminal yeah. going back to your inspiration question from earlier i i love liminal states um i love i love the idea of I'm just like sidelining your whole conversation right now, Matt. I'm sorry, but I just like I love, I love those ideas of of places of places of transit of of like any story is essentially you know it's some liminal state, it's some version of like transition from one state of being to the next. And I feel like what's interesting is being a director and being in post as it is. It's like it's this ultimate liminal thing where you can kind of see glimpses of what you think it's going to be and what your life was before but it's completely transformed everything in kind of like an amorphous way yeah it's like we were talking about earlier like a little bit of the imposter syndrome it's like you don't feel like you have accomplished yeah. anything but yet you've accomplished this huge task you know accomplished so much and it will feel even more so when it's when it's streaming on something if it's in theaters if it's where like wherever it ends up like it's um I'm stoked. I'm stoked that I'm going to yeah. have that, that, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to have something that I made that I get to show. And like, so like I'm, I'm wanting that to lead to the next job and the next job. And exactly. You know, yeah. so it's, it's weird right now as I'm like, I I've, I've loved teaching, but as I've, you know, I'm like, Oh, I just directed something like, like, <laughs> like yeah. I'll find anything. And they're like, who are you? Like, like, what do you, <laughs> what do you have? And I'm like, I promise I have something. I just like, I can't show you yet. Yeah. So hopefully I think it's, it's going to be just a little longer, just a little longer. Well, fingers crossed. What is yeah. um in the future for you? Um, um, I think that's a great question, Matt. I think, I think that's kind of been what this whole past year has been about. Um, my writing partner, Eric and I, we have been, um, we've been honestly like hard at work working on a few different, um, a few different projects right now that we're really excited about um, that I am hoping will will come to life in a few different ways. Um, I told you about the one mystic that I'm hoping will um, be on a few radars really soon. Um, I can't say too much, but I'm hoping that that will come to a good place. I, I've been writing, I've been writing quite a bit. Um, I've been doing a few like kind of gun for hire outlining pitching writing type jobs. 
um, for, for, for Tremendum and for a few others, just, just that way. But I'm, I'm not sure. I, like I said earlier, like I, I really want to direct again, but this, this has, this has completely been like a, a curveball in my life. Um, and I, I say that with absolute, like, like gratefulness and thanks for it. But like, I was not, I did not have direct a film on my like 2020 bingo card of like where my career was going. I really, I had plans to do the like, Eric and I are going to write together. We're going to get something made that will lead us to writing another thing. And now that it's led to like, the writing stuff is still really happening, but like the directing thing is actually what's going to exist. Um, has I like I don't know I'm not sure but that's that's You're open to it yeah that's I'm, great. I'm super open to it I I, I want to try again I want to do it again I would love to um obviously I would love to be trusted again with with someone else's script but I, I'd also really like a, a swing at getting to like direct something that I like a hundred percent wrote or, or wrote with a writing partner um so I think that's that's probably if not the next step that's the next step that I'd like to do um and yeah, I think, I think really just seeing where the, where the film goes and what happens with that. Yeah. I would be kind of interested in knowing, you know, your approach to directing a film that you've written, you know, what would you do differently? Yeah. I I think I'm interested in learning that too. Um, I think that's kind of why I want to, I want to try. There's a few projects that I'm like, I, I really want to do. Um, and it's just because it's not an interpretation yeah. of a vision, right? It's just pure. No, it's like, this is the vision. And yeah. then any, any interpretation that happens is, is the adapting to like, 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 like what location we have, what does the cast actually look like? What can the technology do? So we're um, a script that we're really excited about that we've, we've been working on for a while. It's called, um, it's called EXO um, and like EXO. And essentially, it's about this group of like mechanical engineering grad students. Um, they break into this this tech billionaire's house um, to steal a piece of equipment that they need they need to borrow um, in order to show off their like their final robotics piece so that they can keep staying in school. But once they break into his basement, uh, essentially his like experimental Iron Man armor attacks them and like latches on and basically like kind of possesses one of their bodies and so it becomes it becomes an escape the night like haunted house type movie but done from like a tech perspective um and just to, yeah that that's that's a project that i really want to do that that yeah, is one cool. that i really want to do like these yeah so yeah, if I'm, I'm pitching that on your podcast, if anyone wants to invest in that, we're we're we would love that. That's that's go, our dude. that's our dream project. Even the art of pitching, probably you could talk about that too. Like, how do you go about the whole pitching process? Um, like I pitching think, a script that you've written. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's been another crazy process. I'm very. I wrote a, a um one of the first projects that really took off that I did with Tremendum was. I wrote a, uh, I wrote a pilot for them. I wrote a pilot for them that uh, really, really proud of. And I got a lot of experience as we were trying to shop that around um, of, of pitching with them and getting to watch them pitch projects, getting to take a look at pitch packets, getting to like really um, like sharpen my teeth and skills on writing material for pitch packets, I think really helped me form that idea where it's like, what's the main idea who are the characters who's the audience what films are this like um that have, that have really helped me i think kind of form that idea of of pitching but once again i think it really comes down to the i think it comes down to the log line too like can can people see it like this this one right now it's like oh can people see the idea of like an evil iron man armor hunting down teens in a mansion like yeah i think so and like yeah. how do i <laughs> like yeah. get them excited about that um, while still showing like, oh, there's heart, there's heart. Yeah, there's universal themes. Yeah. There's there's something to take away from it rather than just, yeah, entertainment. Yeah, yeah. I never want to stop watching or reading things. I think that's important for me too. Um, not even in like a, you know, I want to stay relevant. It's just like, I think that people are brilliant even when they're not and come up with so many things that I just think it's really important as a creative um to um to not consume but to like 
soak in other things and to see what else you're in conversation with. I like, I could be so wrong on that, but for me, like my favorite creative people are the creative people that I'm able to talk movies with, that I'm able to talk music with, that I'm able to talk about, you know, what plays they're seeing. And I just like, I think as a director and writer, like knowing that what you're wanting to do, like probably exists already in some form is okay. Like, I think that was something that started scaring me a lot less once I realized, I know I mentioned earlier, like, versions of things have already existed and Mm. that is that is all right so how can I how can I you know put my own spin on that or like cool cool. I like comic books I like big sci-fi ideas I like all of that but I also really like you know two people talking and figuring out if they're going to stay together or not Mm. can I do both can I do both in the same story like can I mash Mm. up these ideas of 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 genre fiction of of sci-fi or mythology but can i put a can i put it in a modern lens or can Mm. i put it you know can i take something that's traditionally you know horror and can i turn that into a more comedic element or just like like what are the things that make me laugh what are the things that my friends and i want to watch and talk about um i feel like trust those things i think it's okay to like the things that you like um and not like the things you don't like and like I, I know, I guess the bad, the bad version is like, I know what I like to cook because I know what I like to eat. Like that's, 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 that's that's so that I'm making food. This is said all the time. It's like, I'm making food for me. I'm making stuff for me. And I feel like that's anytime I'm writing, I'm like, you know, it's obviously it's different when you're writing for a client or directing for a client, but like, sure. Even with this, like I, I tried to, I, I tried to make a movie that I would want to watch. Um, And even in this genre of like knowing it was going to be low budget, knowing that it was going to have a small, I'm like, my mind, I'm like, what? These are the types of movies that I loved to watch like on on sleepovers when I wasn't supposed to, like, these are the types of movies that I would like watch in college and just like, like, Oh my gosh, like want to tell friends about that. No one else knew of. And I'm like, if I can make one of those for this, like, that's what I want to drive back to feel like kind of like that weird, that weird movie that you'll like, you'll remember and try to be like, what was that called? This couple does this thing. And I'm like, that's, that was tried kind of tried to be what we tried to emulate with that. Yeah. How awesome. What's next for you? What are you doing? What is next for me? I have like, Oh, well, I'm like, we can talk off mic. Oh, I know, right? Did. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> did I even start the recording? Pro- oh, I did. Okay, cool. <laughs> Could you imagine? Um, I mean, other than, you know, you saw that little kid's book that I just put out recently. Yeah, that was super cool. But I wanted to, I've always wanted to turn these episodes, like of these podcast episodes into books. Okay. You know, just the topics of like intuition and filmmaking, yeah. psychology and filmmaking, whatever, you know? And I've always like thought like, well, I can't do it until I'm, you know, towards the end of my career or whatever, when I have the experience, you know, to to talk about it. But I'm like, why not? Why not why now? Not? You know? Why not? Yeah. Yeah. So I just blanket kind of statements of, you know, intuition and filmmaking. And then, you know, some little examples of just, you know, what I've learned along the way. You know, because yeah. I haven't done a feature film yet. You know, I have ideas, you know, yeah. but oh, you know, going back to um, you know, how you start your writing process with with structure. I usually I see I see visuals first. So like I'll see a scene at first and I structure the whole film kind of around like mm-hmm. that one visual and so you know even in terms of you know writing the structure i'm like okay what should be the <laughs> you know what yeah, should yeah, yeah. This be what should this be you know um and i do really like specific story uh, beats that i really want to be intentional about uh would be the opening image and final yeah. image for sure same swear by those as well i think those are super important yeah i mean just for an example if anybody wants to see it the whale by darren mm-hmm. aronofsky you know Started yeah. the first image completely black, final one completely engulfed in light. Yeah. You know, something so simple like that, but metaphorically, you know, powerful for the entire film. So that's just visual language. And you even mentioned a little bit visual language when um, introducing characters. I know you talked about like dialogue and all that, but yeah, how fun is it to, uh, you know, visually introduce characters in some, you know, creative way? I think so. Yeah. I think in, 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 oh my gosh, in a creative way, I think one of the biggest, I I've always, you know, I, I grew or went to college on the whole idea of like uh, opening image, closing image and having that symmetry. And it's, it's also been one of those interesting things though. Like 
obviously, like I said, our, our first location changed. Um, and so much of the, the opening image and then the closing image were based off of that first location. And so it's been very interesting, readjusted things in a way though. And I'm really cool. Like for me, what it's kind of expanded into versus just opening image and closing image is almost like my opening scene. Mm. Now we've added kind of like a, almost like a little quick prologue before this engagement party scene. Like it, it serves as kind of like a complete thematic antithesis to the ending scene and closing image um, in a way that I was like, like that was kind of, I realized that was the goal that I wanted once I was like, oh, wait, if the opening image can't be the same, what if these scenes mirror each other, but it comes to a different conclusion? Um, and so that's currently how the film ends. And that was a really, a really neat place to get to. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I messaged, I, I emailed my screenwriting professor, who's also a, a she's, she's a working filmmaker. Um, but I emailed her once I had watched the most recent cut and was like, hey, I, I'm really excited for you to see this. Then you're going to be proud because like the story beats are happening minute wise, like, you know, where they're supposed to or whatever. But I'm like, I'm like, I, this, this truly felt like a, like, like a doing the assignment of, mm -hmm. of like going through and trying to prove like, yeah, because it, it's so writing is so different than directing even even if you are like directing because I've, I've directed shorts that i've written before and stuff like that or but it's like what's the the george lucas the harrison ford to, to george lucas it's like george you can write this stuff but it's hard to say like that's kind <laughs> of what it feels like it's like you can write this stuff but it's hard to direct you're mm -hmm. like what does that actually look like blocking wise what is what does this scene look like as a two shot visually yeah. so something that i say to my students and it's like i'm the age group that I've been working with most recently is uh, is middle school. So it's like 13, 14, 15 year olds um, who are immensely creative. And looking back in my life, like I do not think I was ever more creative than when I was like 13 years old and just had, you know, a million ideas a second. But yeah, that freedom, right? That, that freedom, freedom in your imagination. That, that, that unbridled freedom where you don't care if it's, you don't care a if million it's dollars. <laughs> you don't care if it costs a million dollars. You yeah. don't care if it involves um characters that you know you'll never be allowed to use you don't care if it's like a side sequel to star wars episode three you're just like you're like this is what i like like yeah of course i'm gonna write a kingdom hearts prequel origin story like hell yeah that's what i'm gonna do like oh i want to do something set in the zelda world like yeah like all of those things there's a difference between having awesome ideas and and writing it down and i think that that sounds like such basic like like oh you know like that's the, obviously write it down but it's like I think that's one of the reasons why I I swear by the outline is because at the very least you have the full idea down you have the full version of the story down versus like like I hate I hate half opened final draft documents like they drive me crazy you're like you know pulling something up that's like, you know, seven pages in and I'm like, well, this idea was great, huh? And it's like, that's a harder, that's harder to go back to. It's harder to go back to a a seven page final draft for me at least than it is going to like an outline of like, you can still prove the proof of concept. You can still prove to yourself, hey, oh, this works or this doesn't work. And you can adapt that or change that to a feature. So I feel like my biggest word of encouragement is like, like figure out what the whole story is. Cause at least, you know, even if it's bad, even, even if it's the bad version, put the whole thing down so that you have it um, to, to play with. Trust the people around you. I think that's one of the biggest things is like part of your job as a director is like to, to, you know, to assemble a team that you trust and that you want to be with and that, you know, can do it. And then it's like, once they're there, like, like keep trusting them and and realize like yeah if you did if you did your good job assembling like everyone wants to move forward together um this next part is going to sound so much uh cockier than it's supposed to be because obviously i've talked to you for like three hours now and you've, <laughs> you've, heard, you've heard like the depth yeah yeah you've like you've heard the depths of my soul of like this is a really hard thing to do but it's like getting out and doing it and trying to do something is, is, is a lot easier than it sounds like, like I have now directed a feature 
which is something that even two years ago, I would not have been able to say or think that I would be able to say. And it was because I said yes to other opportunities to, to get to that place. Opportunities that I probably like was not even prepared for. Like I, I was not prepared to direct a feature, which meant I had to do work to direct the feature. I'm, I'm very glad I did it. I think it can be easy to say to say no because of worried you're not ready yet or worried mm-hmm. like you're not going to have the perfect one. Like, like oh man, like I don't want to direct this short film or, or I'm not ready to write this script yet because I need my first one to be perfect or I need my first one to be that version of me. It's like a bad movie that gets made is is better than like the best movie that doesn't exist that's in your head or is in your notebook or whatever. And so I guess that's my biggest thing is like, like you're not going to know if you're going to be good or not until you try it. Like it's, Mm -hmm. it's that whole, it's that whole rule. So I guess that would be the thing is like, like find opportunities where you can do that. And also like shadow people, like one of the reasons why I was able to do this, I think the way that I was into the level that I was, was because I, when I wrote the pilot for, for Tremendum, I was, I was on set every day like you know as as the writer watching the director's work Mm -hmm. i i was you know i was shadowing that and seeing seeing how they interacted with actors how they interacted with the dp and like it's also it's it's just regardless of your first time whatever you do it's going to be trial it's going to be baptism by fire it's Mm -hmm. literally going to be like you are going to learn so much more every single day than you did the day before but like that's the point the point the point isn't to go in perfect the point is to go in and like you learn how it's done for sure wow man great episode great topics <laughs> thank you for coming on mr cody ashford <laughs> oh, oh man thanks matt this is good yeah we should we should do this again absolutely well please like um let everybody know what your social media is where they oh, can yeah. find you you can follow me on at kodash 27 on instagram and you can follow my uh my tiktok account also which is very, very poorly named at Cody Ashford. Um, so you can find me as easily as the middle school students that stalk me. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, uh, yeah, find me on that. And um, I'm, yeah, I'm hoping to have some announcements really soon. Watch, watch movies, read comics. Read yeah. comics, love it. <laughs> read, comics. That's a, read comics, hey, that's a great way to get visual language down. Oh, it's such a great way to get visual language. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, um, it's all storyboards. Yeah, pretty much. 100%. Yeah. yeah. Cool, man. All right, All right Matt. Well, thank you so Thanks, much. Enjoy your you Sunday. Bye. <laughs> All right. Bye.